Welcome to Eyeball's webinar series, Bioscan, Illuminating Biodiversity. Today we are joined by Dr. Ralf Peters with the German Barcode of Life, or GBOL. Ralf is the head of the GBOL's current project called GBOL 3 Dark Taxa. His talk, titled New Species, New Barcodes, New Taxonomists, the GBOL 3 Dark Taxa concept, introduces the German team's efforts to focus on the understudied or unknown part of biodiversity, the so-called dark taxa. He'll explain how taxonomy, delimitations, descriptions and species characterization are crucial elements of truly illuminating biodiversity. His team is using modern integrative taxonomical approaches including morphology, DNA barcodes, genomes, historical information and new research collaborations to strengthen and deepen knowledge about the natural world. Ralph is the head of the Hymenoptera section of the Zoological Research Museum Alexander König, Leibniz Institute for the Analysis of Biodiversity Change in Bonn, in Germany. Welcome, Ralph. Take it away. Um, hello, everybody. I'm uh, very happy to be given the opportunity to give a talk in this wonderful uh, webinar series on our project called GBO3 Dark Taxa. Uh, taxonomy and DNA barcoding initiative, talking about the, the concept behind this project and why this might be of relevance for, for biodiversity research. To start with, I put this, this very short two words term up here, illuminate biodiversity, um, that nicely summarizes basically everything we're doing and also what we're talking about um, today. And it's also used as the, the motto, if you like, of the, the Bioscan initiative. Um, so something that, that many of you will be familiar with. And I illustrated this with a bunch of insects down here, specifically Hymenopterans. And um, as you will notice, well, I'm an entomologist. So as you will notice, uh, many of the stuff I'll be talking about is a bit insect biased. And uh, I'd like to use the first few slides for some sharing some very general thoughts and ideas about what we um, thinking about when we are using this term illuminate biodiversity. And the first one being, see, what is biodiversity? And this, this may be trivial for many of you, but still, I think it's good to go over this to, to start with. Um, biodiversity is species it's even often used as a synonym of species richness, but that's not all. It's also about interactions and the species come with their own morphology, genomes, and biogeography. There's not only species, there's also populations. And we have to be aware that biodiversity is changing over time and space. So, so what we're trying to illuminate here is it's a pretty complex thing. And the second thing to start with is some sort of summary of the, the reasons why we have to illuminate biodiversity and uh, something like that I like to call our common main goals that I think we can all agree on. And I put this here in, in three bullet points. First one being explaining biodiversity and um, we're trying to do this understanding evolution that's, that's closely connected and we do this in, in evolutionary research and also in ecology. And of course, safeguarding fostering biodiversity that's closely um, represented by this term conservation here, something of course of uttermost importance in the context of biodiversity in these, these times of, of, of great biodiversity loss. The third one being benefiting from biodiversity um, through the, um, the, the ecosystem services, um, the many of them, as you, as you will know, and um, also put this here, recreation and joy, that's something that we become more and more aware of that biodiversity is also important because um, it will make or keep people healthy and happy. And then in turn, biodiversity loss will make people sad and sick. And that's, of course, a real um, problematic aspect of this as well. And uh, the third one is just an example, again, a bit hymenoptera. Um, bias because the, the venoms or, or components of the venoms might um, form something like a pharmacopoeia and in which parts might be beneficial um, for humans. And we have to know all this 
um, and and the, the biodiversity that's that's beneath it. So I think we can reach a broad consensus among us here, definitely, but also among um, many parts of the public in many countries of the world, that uh, illuminating biodiversity, caring about biodiversity is is uh, important, and uh, even also many politicians in many countries would agree on uh, on 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 this that biodiversity is important, even though actions. Um, are lacking behind sometimes in a really severe or grotesque way. So with this said that these are the common goals and we don't really have to, to argue for that, um, the question would be, well, how to do it? And uh, one way to approach it and to, to, um, to contribute to the illumination of biodiversity is done through DNA barcoding initiatives and the assembling reference libraries and uh, thereby assembling and making applicable what we are, what we have, and and know, so illuminating it, um, if you like. And um, well, this is about GBOR three, and this directly implies that there must be also GBOR one and two, and and there are. Um, so it's time to talk a bit about GBOR to give you some some background of this um, project to also to understand the status um, we are now. Well, GBOR is the German barcode of life, and the aim of the project is a DNA barcode reference library for all fauna, flora, and fungi of Germany. It was launched in 2011, second phase ended in 2019. And as you can see, it was conducted by, by, by a big consortium of research institutions and uh, universities, including the Museum König, where I am uh, based, it was funded by the German Federal Ministry of Education and Science. And uh, not only used the the expertise in these research institutions, but also the expertise of, of hundreds of non-professional taxonomists, citizen scientists, contributing to this goal of this reference library. And it, it, it follows a, a, um, a pipeline that many of you will be familiar with of sampling specimens, collecting the respective data attached to that, to that sample and building up a voucher collection. So very importantly to have a a physical voucher um, connected to your DNA barcode. So then you generate your, your barcode and you put it into a publicly accessible database. So um, the core of this pipeline in, uh, is to have the three things, the physical voucher, the DNA barcode sequence, and a database entry that connects all of these. And if you look at some numbers, what has been achieved, um, here are some examples from different animal groups. So this is just uh, uh, on animals here, including a mega diverse group of insects, that, that's the beetles up here, also the chordates, so all the, the, the vertebrates um, included, and web spiders, for example. We don't have to go through all of them in detail, but you will see that the green part, meaning the proportion of species that are uh, already in the database in the reference library, is always two thirds or more. Um, and also this a very crucial part of this, this first two phases was to build up a functional database. Um, it's not a trivial task to have a functional database for all of these data, metadata, sequence data, um, but this is up and running. Um, you can go to the web portal and search for your, 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 your taxa and uh, search for your, your sequences, sorry, technical problems. Can I go to the next slide? There it is. Um, sorry for that. Um, search for the database entries, where they are from, etc. So I should say that these two, two first phases were very successful. And you, there are some numbers here. So more than 20,000, 27,000 species included the astounding number of samples processed at, the, at a very good success rate. And Again, looking just at animals, you have a list of 44,000 species roughly recorded for Germany, more than 20,000 of these already represented in the library, so that's just below 50%. And this already, these data that are, that are used and accessible, um, so this assemblage of, of knowledge already made a lot of applications better, more precise, and faster. But there's also some, some gaps and problems that we have to talk about. So if you look at 
two very um, diverse insect groups, that's Hymenoptera, so that's bees, wasps, and ants, and Diptera, so that's flies, gnats, and midges and stuff. You see kind of, that's the same pie, pie chart if you, that I've shown before, just for these two groups. And you see that the green part is one third at max. So this already indicates that there's still a large gap. And to explain this gap in a bit more detail, I'm gonna use um, this number here from a paper testing um, the, the reference libraries in a way in, with my lace traps, so traps for flying insects and to see how many of the specimens in a trap can actually be assigned to a, a database entry. And uh, many are not. So at least 25% of the German animal species are not um, included there, representing at least 50% of the flying insect specimens. So this, this are very diverse and abundant understudied taxa. I'm using the term dark taxa here before, I'm gonna explain it a bit uh, in more detail later. And uh, the two most important groups here are parasitoid wars, also gonna mention them throughout the talk and something you could call lower diptera, so that's gnats and midgets, etc. cetera. Um, so we are aware that we have these knowledge gaps and, um, but to really um, verify this hypothesis that the, the biodiversity, the actual biodiversity uh, out there is in parts unknown or understudied, um, to really verify this is not, not a trivial task, but we have, I've assembled here some quotes from recent publications that really point into this direction and give evidence on, on what the situation really is. First one being on fidgetids, one group of diverse group of parasitoid wasps, saying that even in Europe, at least 50% of the species are in fact still undescribed. Second one is on a family called Terramalidae, that's a recent publication from our consortium, um, in superfamily Chalcedoidea, saying estimating the diversity of this group is, is not possible. It has to be assumed that many more species are still to be discovered in Germany. The third one is also published recently, is on diptera species, and saying there's a surprisingly high proportion of undetected biodiversity, and they estimate that something around 2,000 species await discovery and description in Germany in uh, these four families. We don't really have to care at this point which four families those are, but there's a lot of diptera families, and these are just four. And the fourth quote here is kind of the, the problem on a different level. It's again about um, Chalcedoidea species from, from Germany, saying that more than one third of these uh, species are known just from a single record and usually those records are neither detailed nor vouchered and more than two-thirds of the species on the list have never been taxonomically revised so this translates into that you have a list with names but still you don't really know what they are so this was just germany and and europe so if you put it on a global scale of course this the the, the problem is even uh, more obvious and severe um two more quotes on that from um, something I'm working on in, in, with, with a colleague in, in my group on a super family called Seraphronoidea. So um, with the, this, the, the material we are studying, this allows us to estimate the real species richness of this group being at least 20,000 species, while the number of described, described species, including what we've just done, is just about 700. In kind of the same picture in, uh, in Chalcedoidea, with an estimate of more than 500,000 species, of which only, well, this needs a bit of update, it's 23,000 species have been described, so that's below 5%. So the, this, this but continues, there, there are many dark taxa and there are large gaps. Um, and if we wanna illuminate biodiversity and remember what this means, it's not about just species, it's interactions, dynamics, evolution, conservation, all of this that we wanna, study and this means illuminating the diversity we have to say that at this point for achieving these goals we lack data and expertise and because we agree that we want to do this illuminate biodiversity conclusion is simple we have to go and generate the data and expertise and for this um, we will need large taxonomy initiatives um, so projects specifically targeting this unknown diversity 
And this is not just about collecting those tucks and sorting them out. It's definitely about also about training new taxonomists, so people who know these groups and can work with those groups and formulate research questions in those groups. And it also includes how to do taxonomy, so constant re-evaluation on the um, methods and concepts you have on, on the best way to do taxonomy in, uh, um, in, in the year 2022. And then how to publish this, so make all of this that you gather really accessible and usable, and transfer the knowledge to everyone, uh, the public and the scientific community um, to, to, um, to tell why this is important and what we already have. And DNA barcodes are still a tool of high relevance here because they will help you with your taxonomy and the reference libraries that are created are a perfect means to make this data and expertise accessible. So with this said, kind of back at my title slide of new species, new barcodes, new taxonomists, um, which is which is our, our concept in that project. So we're not gonna talk about a bit more in detail about uh, GBO3 dark taxa. We're using this term dark taxa, and I, I think everybody kind of has an idea, and I've used it before in this talk, what this is. It's, it's something unknown, but I really like to, to um, define it in a, a bit more um, bit more explicit way what this means so it means that we have no reliable complete or vouchered lists of species and no clear characterization of species so we don't know what these species are no identification keys no reference collection means no no place to go and look things up no barcodes to sequence information so no information from the molecular side and no taxonomic specialist which is no, no person to turn to and ask it does not have to be as ultimate as I put it here with the no, 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 no. Um, of course, there's scattered information here and there, but the, the, basically the picture for many of these taxa looks like this. And um, looking at the aims in a bit more detail, so basically this is the concept with just a few more words. We're targeting in this project Germany's unknown insect biodiversity. And so this is a German project, but it's also covering Central Europe, obviously. And um, what we're trying to do is target these dark insect taxa to increase the knowledge of the German insect fauna, which may sound trivial, but definitely it's not. And we're improving the size and quality of the DNA barcode reference library and train a new generation of taxonomists, very importantly. So new generation of people well-trained in, in the organisms, in the methods, in evolution, and in species concepts. And we're using an integrative taxonomic approach in a large network for that. And last bullet point here, communicate all of this very importantly to everybody to say why this is important and what we are doing to put them on the map. And again, this is a, a consortium effort. The consortium is smaller than in the previous phases of GBOL and it includes the, the museum, research museum König in, in Bonn, the natural history museum in Stuttgart, the Zoological State Collection in Munich, the University of Würzburg, and the Krefeld Entomological Society. And again, this is funded by the German Ministry of Education and Science. A few more numbers on the project. Uh, total budget is 5.3 million euros, 20 positions funded in this project. And uh, you can see the runtime here, so we're basically right in the middle of it. And um, these are some of the people, many of the people in, involved. And of course, all of these will play an important role in the, um, in the project. But I'd really like to pick out and highlight one group of people um, here, and that's the, the PhD students, which really are the heart and the core of, of, the, of the project. And well, I've mentioned training in new taxonomists. Um, and these are the people that are trained in the, in the respective groups and in the respective methods and concepts, etc. And of course, there would be a, a ton of interesting things to tell you about all these, the introducing the, the groups, the taxonomic groups they're working on and, and uh, their, their research questions. There's no time, obviously, in, in a talk like this. So I'm just going to pick out just a few things so that you can understand better how we are doing approaching the dark taxa in this project. I'm choosing the part on that's on, on parasitoid wars because that's also what, what I am and my group is working on. And um, a parasitoid wars, um, if you look at Hymenoptera, you see that 
everything that's not a the bee, a sawfly, or an ant is a wasp. And those wasps that develop on or in another organism, thereby killing this organism that's also known as the host, that's a parasitoid wasp. So that's a group of often small, but not always small um, hymenopterans. And we have this hymenoptera um, tree here, and I'm gonna zoom into the relevant parts. Um, so these are the, the parasitoid wasp lineages, and you have those super families here that maybe you're, you've heard of or are familiar with, with some of them, but um, probably not all of them, because even many entomologists are not really familiar with these groups and what they are. But the, the mega diversity of hymenoptera and parasitoid wasps lies in these uh, groups. So also the, the, the dark taxa problem is within uh, these groups of parasitoid wasps here. So these are the two hymenoptera-focused PhD students in my group. And based on, on their work, I'm just going to very briefly go through some, some of the research questions and, and projects um, they are doing. This will give you an idea how we're working in, in GBOL3. First one is what, what they're all doing is taxonomic revisions, characterizing species. So I really like this term, characterizing species, because it includes species delimitation, of course but also adding all other characters that you can find to really know what the species um, is. And we're using an integrative approach there, so including all sources of, uh, um, of evidence that we, can, that we can get. And Jonathan is specifically targeting a, a genus called Clydotoma, again, in the family Fidgetids um, that, that I mentioned earlier. This is what they look like, small parasitoid wasps. And you have eight species recorded from Germany there. And our preliminary results, we're right in the middle of it. We still don't know exactly what it is. Show but the, that the real number is between something between 50 and 100. And um, we're using, and that's a really crucial part of, of GBOL3, also external expert collaborators. So we're trying to include all this rare taxonomic expertise on these groups that's available around the globe into the project and these people also supervising the PhD students in, um, in, these organism, in these organisms. And of course, a taxonomic project like this involves a lot of collecting, for example, with Malaysia traps, traveling around Europe and, and uh, adjacent countries and gathering your material. Second example from those projects that I like to give is exploring integrative taxonomy. Um, and that's also part of what I mentioned, this constant re-evaluation about what taxonomy is, how to do it, what are the, the, um, the concepts and methods we can use to make taxonomy as, as fast and accurate um, as possible um, in, the, in, in this year 2022 that we're in now. And one example is that you see here on the left is, um, is wing interference patterns. So these are parasitoid wars wings, and if done correctly, they will reflect the light in a, in a distinct way. And you can find interspecific differences in um, these patterns on the wings, if done properly. Um, and you can do this just with, with your eye and see, well, well, is there a difference or not? But what we're also doing now is try to see how, how machine learning uh, approaches can help you with species recognition, and then maybe even with species delimitation in these groups. The second example here on the on the right is um, is on a on a uh, um, on something that that is also called taxonomics that is using genomic data for the purposes of taxonomy, and um, so this is still a preprint, hopefully out as a as a as a real paper soon, in which we propose the use of standardized um, universal nuclear markers. Um, for taxonomy, so hundreds of, of, of molecular markers here, and to explore the possibility of these taxonomics and how you can also combine morphology and genomics in a meaningful way. Also, how you can do optimized species delimitation, ideally, um, to, well, to test this and explore this further. That's, for example, done by Samin for one, her group of parasitoid wars and one of her um, projects of her PhD. And the third one is basically about evolution. Now, I mentioned evolution earlier, and of course, this, all these things are tightly linked. And uh, this is again on, on a group of fidgeted, so from Jonathan's uh, work. 
um, subfamily called Eucoline. So that's a very species rich abundant group of parasitoid wars. And we're, we're building a new phylogeny based on whole genome sequences there. And we're doing this for reclassification, but also for tracing evolution of some, some uh, very interesting traits. And I've mentioned just two here um, that are important in this group. One is virus domestication. So it's some really intriguing stuff that these wars, they include virus genes into their genome to help them escape the, the host's immune response. Not all of them do this and how and uh, this evolved and how they do this, that's going to be part of this um, project here. And if we can map this on an on a updated phylogeny, of course, that will help a lot. And the second one is on phenotypic traits. And there's one example, that's the Scutella plate. Of the, all of the Eucoline, you have that, and it's really obvious and um, character. And, and this is it. It's kind of, it's a nice uh, image, but kind of a, a strange perspective because this is kind of a, a front to dorsal view. So imagine you're standing on the, on the head of the walls and looking to the rear end. That's basically then what you want to gonna see. So you have the plate and uh, this pit here with pores. And this is the micro CT scan. We've just started this. So this is not nicely reconstructed yet, but you can see here, that's the part underneath the plate that there's a large gland there. And what this looks like, and how, um, so the morphology and the, the chemistry of this um, of this plate and gland is something that we're going to explore um, in this uh, in this project here. So, just a few more things. I thought about skipping these because I'm, I'm aware that I'm really rushing through these things, but um, um, maybe even just a few keywords would still be. Um, helpful to understand what we were doing in this project. So I kept this slide, and, but it's really, really quick here. Um, so there's one project because projects like these also have to carry a lot about methods, obviously. And one revolves around the question, is, is it possible and necessary to sequence whole genomes from poor quality samples? Because that's what we're facing in many cases because we have small amounts, small samples, not properly stored. And we're trying to get the best out of it. So we, we, we have a project targeting um, targeting this. And the second one here is on the on the database. So we constantly have to improve um, and extend the database because that's our channel to really put um, the data and expertise out there. And uh, especially it's gonna include the, something that that's um, OTU or but the ASV based data can be um, can be databased and and used, especially important for the the meta barcoding community. Um, yeah, so if you want to know more about um, the German barcode of Live and GBOL three, visit our websites um, where you can find a lot of information or follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. And um, so for the for the uh, for our project, I think we can safely say that we have a concept, a transferable concept, and we have already a proof of concept. So this, this is nothing usually that you say, well, to, to, um, to think about how to put this in a proposal and how to, to, um, to approach potential funders and, um, and discuss with them why this is important or not. So this is all not, not necessary anymore here because this is already designed, funded, up and running, and uh, the, the the, the ministry followed our argumentation why we need this and to do this in this way. And definitely we're gonna make some good progress on the Central European fauna. But keep in mind the term illuminating biodiversity then obviously this is not enough. So we need this concept transferred and also complemented, multiplied and on, on larger scales. And one example that goes into this direction is the, the Caucasus Barcode of Life project that I'd like to mention here. Um, this also coordinated by the Research Museum König together with the University of Tbilisi. It's also funded by the German Ministry of Education and Science. This is one example to transfer basically tree ball ideas into um, another region where these gaps are even more severe. The, the Caucasus um, is one of the biodiversity hotspots of the world. And um, we're mainly working with Georgian and Armenian colleagues in this um, project and making some progress there. 
Um, something else that I'd like to share with you is um, some direct things that we do with these results. I mean, mentioned this before that, that we, we illuminate biodiversity also to study evolution and do conservation. And just a few examples from, from, from uh, studies also in our groups that I'd like to mention here where we directly need and use the data we produce. The first one will be on evolution and uh, evolution of uh, Hymenoptera. And I'm also put this here because this was something that's been puzzling me uh, in my work over the last well, basically 10 years. And uh, the core there is the mega diversification of parasitoid wasps. But because if you want to understand evolution of Hymenoptera, you have to understand evolution of parasitoid wasps. And they're so diverse and abundant that I would even argue that for to, to understand evolution of insects or even life on earth, you should target the parasitoid was. And then, well, there's many questions you can ask, basically saying the, the how, when, and why they became so diverse. And uh, remember that we have this phylogenetic tree, but this is by far not enough, not detailed enough to really get your head around this question, understand what's going on. And um, saying, so for answering all these questions, you need a, well, basically a good tree. And then you need a fairly good idea of the diversity of, in this case, Hymenoptera and Pastoid was. And the first one's gone, is delivered by phylogenomics, second one um, by taxonomy. And you can also translate this fairly good idea into a fairly well illuminated biodiversity. You need um, that knowledge to be able to understand what's going on in the evolution of the group. Second example would be on, on, on conservation. And I think you've all heard of, of the study here down here on the left published by Hallmann et al. a few years ago, reporting about a, a massive decline of insect biomass and, and biodiversity in, even in protected areas in, in Germany. And um, this is really an alarming paper showing that we have a massive problem of biodiversity loss also in, in uh, in a, in a country like Germany, in an industrialized country, so it will be no real big difference in other industrialized uh, nations. And it's a really unique data source. And uh, this really was a game changer also for us, because it's also right at our doorstep, if you like. So the, the bond where I'm located is kind of in the, in the middle of all these data points here, so in the very same region. And very recently, another paper um, published both with the uh, contribution of our colleagues in the Entomological Society of Krefeld, showing a few more details about this, also about the reasons for this problem, and that's pesticide exposure. So they've shown that even in, in uh, conservation areas, you will find um, lots of insecticides and other pesticides in different combinations um, that, that contribute to this problem. So, and if you really want to understand why this happens and which groups are, are, are affected and disappearing, um, you again will need a fairly good idea of the diversity of, well, you can extend this here of, it's not just time and opera of, of, of insects in this case. And uh, so again, you will need um, illuminated biodiversity to be, um, to be able, um, we, we know enough to, to, to act now, but to really get into the details, we, we will need this. So going back to this term and, and, and how to do it. So I've presented here this, this concept we have behind. And the one basic message would be that, that I think it, it can be done. And uh, remember those people, those are the ones that really make a difference, I would say. Um, so they already do and will in the future, knowing the groups, knowing how to to, um, to make taxonomy, know about the backgrounds and evolution and conservation, et cetera, um, they would play their part in illuminating biodiversity. So, so um, um, this is very, very important to state here. And um, now I would like to advocate also for some, some boldness and self-confidence in, in, in these things, also especially when approaching uh, funders or, or politicians um, a bit in the way, like an extreme, like I put it here in this little um, conversation on the right. And even though this mountain to climb and this wall of dark taxa might be discouraging from time to time, there's really no need to uh, give up. So with, with large initiatives, 
and um, uh, and all these these uh, these new taxonomies taxonomists trained, we can really do it. But before I finish, there's one more slide on something that I, I really uh, like to mention because I think it's important. Because all the stuff that I've been talking about is about what we don't know. So it's about dark taxa and also from the perspective of a parasitoid wasp person, there's a lot of, well, I don't know, I have no clue, it's below 5%, etc. So you could, you could argue that, well, we're really missing basic things, and that's true. But that does not mean that we should not do other things in parallel and start doing this. One thing is biodiversity monitoring or targeting species di uh, dynamics. Even the data we have at hand now might only cover 50% of the species, but still already there, but already they are better, more precise than anything we've had before. So yes, of course, biodiversity monitoring should be done with, without the, the deeper knowledge on, on, uh, on the, the taxonomy of many species, especially if you think of properly vouchering um, specimens and, uh, and databasing the data so that, you, that it will allow for a reanalysis re maybe in some years time when you know more. And maybe even more importantly, also conservation efforts that need to, do, need to be done now. So the worst thing that could happen is that people tell us, we just don't know enough. We just have to wait. No, the opposite is true. We know enough to act now, but in parallel, we need these initiatives um, to make the, the data behind it more, more complete and precise. And um, mainly I've talked about species discovery. And so and, and a species with a name that's nicely diagnosed is a, is a, is a wonderful thing. But of course, that's not all. Um, so we have also have to start targeting the life histories and these interactions, et cetera. And uh, also start the, the genome atlas initiative. So sequencing the whole genomes and they are bold claims to, the, from initiatives trying to sequence the whole genome of all metazoan life basically. And that, that's a good idea. It's a long way to go obviously, but to start this and have these whole genomes available will really also um, improve our understanding and our illuminated biodiversity. And one initiative that I'd like to mention here is the European Reference Genome Atlas ERGA um, that even teamed up recently with uh, the, the Bioscan Europe initiative for a joint proposal. So ideally the taxonomy initiatives, the barcoding initiatives and the genome initiatives are tightly interlinked and working together um, with the goal of illuminating biodiversity. And you can continue this, this, this list with, with other things that, um, that um, are currently running. And I'd like to close with a short summary on this. Um, so we need to illuminate biodiversity and I, I think there's no doubt and um, no, no point discussing this further. Illuminating biodiversity needs large scale taxonomy initiatives. And our project might serve as an example, a proof of concept that's already up and running and where you can see um, that people will fund this and also can see the results and um, of what we are doing. But of course we need more and larger and also maybe other initiatives, especially in the global south. So we have a ton of problems in Central Europe, but the, the gaps in other countries um, are obviously even more severe. And uh, last one refers to the, the slide that we just had previously um, that other things can, should, and must be done uh, in parallel. So no need to wait, we can act now already. And uh, with this, I'd like to thank you for your intention on behalf of the whole consortium. So remember this is the consortium effort and I'm just the speaker of this consortium presenting this here to you. And um, yes, I'm, I'm happy to, um, to take your questions. So um, I can now welcome Ralph Peters into this. So we're now live. Everything so far was recorded. And I'm also welcoming Vera Udu, who's um, the GBO general coordinator. So both of them are here joining me in this panel to answer your questions. And the questions you can um, send to us using the question and answer symbol at the bottom and just type in the questions and what I'm going to do, which is why I'm looking always down here, is trying to reach uh, to read your questions and then have Ralph or Vera answering them. 
Um, there's one question I have here from Jonathan Koenig at the Smithsonian. Are you perhaps strategizing your approach via higher taxa, for example, genera, or are you proceeding simply as sampling takes place? So I hope you're all yeah. unmuted. Yes. Um, Good. I'm here. So thanks for the question. For the question, and uh, um, so I'm not exactly sure what what, what the about the question by, by Jonathan Cottingham, um, what, I have to read it again, sorry for that. No, of, of, um, so we're strategizing um, to hire taxa. So if all of the projects really have a, have a clear taxonomic target um, that it's on family level for the, for the proposal, but um, during development of it of a more specific project it's it's mostly genera that we're specifically targeting because that's kind of well it depends on the size of the genus obviously but that's something that um, in a three and a half year project to start with can be done by well, basically a single person and the team around it so um, most of the time we're targeting family level and if this is too much then genus level Okay, I have another question by Paul here, who asks, GWOL3 is a wonderful start towards a large challenge. Your 12 PhD students will clearly contribute greatly. Looking to the future, how many students and how much time would it take to gain near 90% coverage for the German insect fauna? That is a good question, but still hard to estimate because the unknown part is hard to estimate. But... It's true that this project is a start also only uh, also for the Central European fauna, which is comparatively well studied and also comparatively um, less diverse than other regions. Um, but to cover 90%, we would at least need twice as many people, but that's a rough estimate. I've never really calculated uh, that to have, an, have a number in mind, but um, we are aware that also with this project, we will not, we'll not be able to solve all taxonomic problems of the Central European fauna. And, and luckily we never claimed that we're gonna, we're gonna do this. Um, so um, yeah, this needs to, go, needs to go on and we need, we need definitely more people. And also the dark taxa, we're focusing now on Hymenoptera and Diptera, but obviously there are also dark taxa in other groups, not only insects including also plant dark tax like well, algae or something. So um, if you include all of that and fungi and well, all the other organisms we have, we'd need a, we need a, a bunch of, of dedicated people. Pretty vague, but that's, <laughs> that's the answer I can give. <laughs> um, here's a question from Karen Salazar. Um, she said, thanks. What strategies could developing countries use to optimize knowledge of dark taxa if there are, is no funding? Yeah, thanks. That's, that's a very important question. Maybe, maybe Vera, do you want to say something on, that, on this? Or? Uh, I apologize. I don't have a clear answer because if there's no funding, it's always difficult to, to carry on such a, or to, to carry out such a project. Of course, I, I guess we are all of all of us. We are more or less biologists and zoologists by passion, so we can do a lot of of this in our free time. But then, of course, when it comes to barcoding in laboratories, there's always a cost, or there are always costs behind. So uh, I'm, I'm I'm unsure what what I can advise you now. If if there's no funding, it's always difficult. But uh, maybe give us as, as an example, saying it works. Um, and it's worth the money because uh, money is not all what we need in nature, in nature conservation or in biodiversity conservation. It's, it's, it pays off at the end, I think. Yeah, maybe, maybe if, if I may add so, so, Go ahead. Um, so if there's no funding, then we have to look for funding. Well, that sounds, yeah. sounds, sounds trivial and complicated at the same time, but um, and obviously, well, that's that's a, also a 
a problem not only in biodiversity research but in in uh, well basically all, all fields that definitely it can only go to if you include actively the people in in the mega diverse country of the global south um, for example and this is difficult and there's two ways ideally the kind of the whole global system will be changed in a way that these countries are uh, are um, capable of doing that on their own this is obviously not the case right now and then the other one is like we do it at the moment that um, for example a country like germany funds projects also in other um, in other countries also in biodiversity research the, the Kabul project for the caucasus um, region would be one example which is good obviously but not ideal but more initiatives like this maybe be it's a start and it's, it's also about capacity building uh, as you know which is simple term to to describe a very very complicated um subject but probably that's the way to start spending money from the the richer countries in the in the global north to start these initiatives and hopefully um Build the capacities that, so that these initiatives will be running, will be will run successfully, in the um, in in the countries where the diversity really is. So I have I have more questions here. So I'm going from the the way they're coming in. So um, Stephen Fenn is asking: Is there a link between dark taxa and dark diversity? I, I would I would say that's more or less the same the same thing. If you if you like, um, so dark tax are built up dark diversity. I mean, as you notice from the talk, there's there's no real definition of dark tax. We're using this this phrase because everybody can relate to it in one way or the other. And if you call it dark taxa, specifying the taxa or dark diversity, if you specify it to the diversity, there's no no real big difference. I would say, and there's there's no definition in the strict sense anyway to a dark, what a dark taxon or a dark diversity is it's it's a useful term that that we're we're using and also for communication uh, it's a it's a useful term and that's that's why we use it not for for have a clear definition that's a dark taxon so i have i have two questions here they're sort of following up on what we you earlier discussed as a response to paul's questions about this how much time or students it would need to need to reach 90% coverage for the German insect fauna. So one follow-up for by four by Julian was essentially what proportion of the dark taxa in Germany do you estimate is covered by your PhD student? All of them, I'm guessing. Yeah, no, no, not not, not all of them. Um, uh, we should calculate some numbers, Vera, to it. <laughs> <laughs> so this order, I can also. Oh, it's, it's a good idea to think about it at the end of the project, saying what what is the percentage that we covered or that we we discovered during the project. And so, yeah, and 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 the projects are still running, and we have to see how far the PhD students can really get in those three years that they have for their PhD. But I would say within just within Dipter and Hymenoptera, if we just take that, that we are about to cover something like one third of the dark taxa in this first phase. That's an, at least an estimate. That sounds good. Um, one follow up for, by Paul himself was what would it take to complete the world fauna? That, that is a hard estimate I'm guessing, but maybe you have an idea <laughs> or an opinion. And well, it, it requires large scale um, initiatives, obviously. And um, and also that would be a, a hundreds of a thousands of people working on that, but but would kind of is a lot, but still it's not illusoric, at least in my always kind of positive approach to that. It's it's just a matter of prioritization to, to there are other areas where, where hundreds and thousands of people are working on on a on a thing, and biodiversity should be one of these things. Um, but again, I cannot really give a def definite number how many people this will this will take. But um, what, what, well, we are fully aware that what we are doing is just the start. And we're happy to have this in, for Central Europe, um, but have this on a, on a global scale. 
it will need hundreds or thousands of people. But then let's let's look for hundreds or thousands of people. That I'm saying this easily, back, but yeah. Then, <laughs> then we've come back to the initial to one of the questions. Then we need more funding, and then we find. Also, I hear you. I hear you. So I have a um, question and comment from Jessica Schulz. Um, she says, that was a very illuminating talk. Thank you. My question is about application. Even though we agree among us, often people outside the field want to know more about why we need to describe and understand dark taxa. I'm wondering if you have any specific examples from Germany or your work where a conservation decision or research resource management approach changed after a greater number of species were known than previously. Might be a neat thing to demonstrate as you or we uncover more undescribed species. Mm, yeah, it's a good question. Can you think of a, of a very concrete example just from the top of your head, Vera, that's, that we could uh, use here? Uh, well, I, I, the, uh, as far as I understand it, this is more of a, of a general question or remark saying it's we have to always to convince politi politician makers saying an area is more biologically important, the more species they are. And um, of, of course, what we are doing is, is kind of providing the baseline saying we can name more species in the area saying we, we're moving when we're using uh, meta barcoding, we're moving from the OTUs with no name to species with an attached name on it. Um, but if this list of species in these areas will really convince politic uh, policymakers saying we're going to change our advice and improve conservation measures for certain areas, that's again another topic, I think, if I understand the question correct. Yeah, I, I also might have uh, not thinking about it, uh, an, an example um, of what I've also mentioned them in the briefly in the in the talk, the the, um, the studies we have on insect diversity and or biomass in protected areas. And that we see that even in protected areas, the biodiversity is declining. And we have, for example, we have these very recent uh, data from a project called DINA um, done in, in several German protected areas where we can show that the, the species diversity within protected areas decreases because of, for example, the effects of pesticides that should not be applied within um, the, the protected area, but, but can be found in, the, uh, in the, the area. So that we are claiming that we need large buffer zones around um, nature protected areas between the, the protected area and the, the arable land you have. And that's that would be uh, that's not done yet to be to be to be explicit, but that's something you can directly derive from those diversity um, data. Yeah, I think it's it's always interesting to to try to to tell the public why why you're doing these things, or especially when it comes to dark taxa, and everybody probably questioning, yeah, is that just your scientific curiosity and you got carried away, or has it a real need? And you you mentioned some of them. And to be honest, obviously we have to do a better job in selling them that kind of work that we do because astronomers for example and i hear that that very often they have no problem in in selling big projects like the last one the james webb telescope should not there for billions of dollars um and they really look at something that is equally unilluminated and we don't even know whether there is a practical use for it or not it's just human curiosity but there's way more practical sense in what we're doing so i, I agree with what you said um, as far as I can tell, there's no more questions, so we can wrap it up now. So I really like to thank you again so much for being here with us today, for doing the recording of the presentation, Ralph. Thanks a lot, and thanks to everyone who joined us. Next time, we have a webinar with uh, Michelle van der Bank from South Africa, from the Barcoding Institute down there in Johannesburg. And um, yeah. Stay tuned, look out for the invite for an abstract and the topic that we're gonna be talking about. And I wish you a nice rest of the day. Thank you and bye-bye. <laughs>